I never really had, you know, I mean, my dad's love language is acts of service, you know, and he's great at right. DIY. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to like, diss your dad. Yeah. I mean, like, no, I know my father's, yeah, and so actually, later, actually, my father's, you know, I think I would never have had the relationship I have with my, having my dad now, if in a way, if my mum hadn't passed away. Oh. And uh, you'd, we, me and my sister always thought someone like my father would go first, you know. Mm. But my mum went first, and we. But my dad d- has done his best, you know. And he grew up in an era, East End, Giza, you know. There was like now we can go on a computer and, and on Google and write um, John Bowlby attachment styles. Google and you and the average layperson can read what what their psychology is. But back in the day, poor people had no access to that stuff. Mm. They were kept in the dark. Yeah. You know, and actually, I'm working on a piece at the minute, and I'd like to think it can become a longer piece eventually about the East End. But there's a line in it where I say, I thought about it that way actually, because like the internet's kind of become the great leveler in that regard. Hasn't it, it really has, yeah. And like, if you think, and information it, is power. Exactly, knowledge is power, and I certainly gained incredible self awareness and incredible power and clarity through gaining knowledge. So if you're going to keep poor working class people in the dark. There's a you're going to keep them pigeonholed, and there's a line in my new piece that says pigeonholed like vermin. But the budget you live on doesn't determine your brain's value or discipline, mm-hmm. and you can't put a price on the willpower of the people that have to live with less. You know, and it's this idea that just because you have less doesn't mean you've got any less of a drive or motivation to be something in life. Mm-hmm. But if you're going to keep people pigeonholed, how do you expect them to grow their brains? Yeah, how do you exactly. expect them to access? To, but how, you, how do you expect that person to be the world's best father when they had a shit father themselves? Or how do you expect that yeah, mum? There's that whole thing of like you know, like if your parents are shit like with abuse, uh, victims of abuse, they tend to become abusers themselves. And like you know, obviously, there's no implication to everyone, but there was notable trend. Apparently, you know, when we were studying psychology, for example, it was something that came up, and it was like I can't remember what the study was, but mm-hmm. there was a correlation that they found. Um, and that's no reflection. Yeah, no. I mean, gosh, level, I think one one thing for me, scary. yeah, one thing for me in life is when I eventually was able to access therapy. Like I had ten years of therapy post my mum dying, and I was the kind of person that always said, "Me, I don't need therapy." Yeah, it's a tough thing. And I associated emotions with weakness, you know, because that's mm. what I'd been taught. Again, like I say, I was very loved growing up. But sometimes you can be loved, and Gabor Mate says a lot of this in oh, all his books, I like him, right? Yeah. You can be loved, but if you if you don't sense the love, if you don't access the love in the same way that parent f- thinks feels that they're giving you that love, you can still feel a bit unseen. And yes. you know, and I think my I was very loved, and I my mum went above and beyond for me and my sister. But both my parents were had um, unresolved issues, mm. you know. And I think that in that poem I mentioned, there's a bit where I say it was like. Um, moth to a flame, love to loathe, combust not lust, incessant battles, never won, unresolved, bitter jaws, where, you know, and it's this idea that they were always at each other's throats, but it, you never knew where it started, That's interesting. you know, so, you know, and whilst I would never condone any type of emotional, verbal or physical abuse, or I do come to realise that um, there's always two sides of a story, yeah. you know. Is it coming um, from a place of desperation and sort of miscommunication rather than... I think than, sometimes, I think it's different right. if... I think, intense, yeah, so to speak. and it, and I must say I must mention this because this is something I'm really proud of. I've just secured a, a one year contract working in as a counsellor in women's refuge. Oh wow! And it's That's something amazing. I always wanted to do since I was a teenager. Awesome. Yeah, um, and it will be for twelve months, and I and I accepted it because I'm like, you know what, this is this is what I'm made for, mm. you know, and. Uh, um, it's quite an emotional calling as well, and it's going to be quite emotionally taxing for mm. you as well, because you know somebody's experienced it yeah. to whatever extent. I think. But I want to try and use it in a way where, but at the end, I'm hoping I can make some kind of um, short, not a, not a monologue, spoken word, but like I want to see if I can piece together something where there's a little show, and it's around the effects of. DV on a whole family, not just on the couple themselves. Uh, I reckon that would work quite well as sort of not a puppet show, but you know those um, those ones with the black with the the sort of light behind the screen, um, like the dancers, not marinettes, yeah. sister marinettes. No, marinettes, the ones that come from above. The little 
Potter. You know, when uh, in Harry Potter with the yeah, Deathly Hallows yeah. and the way they tell that, yeah, with the blacked out animations, I think you know, I could imagine that that would be quite an interesting one if you used different Silhouette. colours of colour with that. And that's yeah, quite cool because then yeah. it, would, it would almost play on the idea of we've all got shadows. Yeah, like, you know, yeah, if think... you think of Carl Jung and like this idea, I read a great quote by him recently, and I love his stuff. But he was talking about how you don't, we don't just like walk into the light you know actually it's because you've got to allow your shadows to become conscious you've got to allow the shadows to have a, to have an outlet is that sort you of know, dark we side we do this and, instead yeah know, and we? i we think that's sort of down and because that is that kind of coming from a social a contemporary social attitude do you think because i think that i mean i've been watch because i went through a bit of a, a shit time for about i don't know about a year or two ago and um i kind of had to reconnect with what i had to redefine masculinity almost mm. in a way uh, for myself, because, you know, like, uh, I just kind of had the shit kicked out of me by, you know, and I, I felt terrible about myself. Mm. And, um, you know, like, emotionally speaking, and I, I was a bit like, okay, well, what is and isn't acceptable masculine behavior? Mm. And um, I found a lot of these channels on YouTube, and, you know, like, uh, people like, you know, Sydney Watts, who I think is now a doctor, and, you know, mm. patient Xenia, and things like that. And they will talk about sort of how a lot of the time you find men, you know, the contemporary contemporary men have been kind of told that they have to be emotional at the same time as not being emotional and you know that, that concept of masculinity has become very very skewed and very yeah. kind of confusing and one of the things i like about my current girlfriend for example she's an european and one of the things she said to me is like, i just want you to be a bloke you know like you know like just go out do you know like you know what you, you need to do yeah, yeah exactly you know like you don't know, like pick and put down some heavy stuff if you have to but, but don't feel don't like the emotions are off off you know access or, or you know there is a turn off not allowed. Like, don't to talk too much about their emotions, but at the same time, a little bit, you know. Like, I like it. I think it's good. Eventually, I think it's a bit easier. I think it's good if they can. I, I mean, there's this whole thing, isn't there, about conscious men now? And you're right. Like, I, I, I agree with you. I think there's a bit of a crisis for some where they don't know where to sit with it because women are in this power stage of life where so many women are just like going forward and like leading away from yeah. things. And you can feel a bit, people can feel a bit. Em- emancipated, mm-hmm. if that's the yeah. word, you know, but demasculated, I think. What is it? Emancipated or demasculated? Who cares? What does emancipated mean then? Um, like when you're sort of, or oh, like removed, freed, like yeah, at a young age. yeah the emancipation proclamation is where you remove yeah. yourself. It's from interesting. The body. That... I know, like in America, you can get emancipated when you're under age as an adult. So. So it's interesting. Yeah, my um, I I do used to do that a lot. When I was um. When I was um, growing up, because I had quite restrictive vocabulary, I used to, like, this when I was a journalist. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> but, but, yeah, and do you know what? I have to say, the reason is, again, when I was hyper-focused on this idea that I was like, I've got to master English, because yeah. it became I, it, it was it became acutely aware to me at a certain age that I couldn't, I wasn't as, 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 as eloquent as others, right? Mm. And I was hungry for language. I would have loved to have studied linguistics or... You know, and I'd love to like, like I'm, I'm, obsessed, I'm obsessed with the idea of dialects and how it connects to belonging. You know, oh, yeah, because like, I and, think like it's it's interesting in England, for example. Like, mm. I mean, compared to America or other places I've been, like, um, the accent changes every twenty miles, if not less. Mm. Especially in London, London you can go. You know, I mean, there's a difference with South London, and you can hear it. But mm. I mean, do you think that accents kind of have a lot to do with who, what makes us, or is it more like the environmental factor behind where we come from that's part of it? Or, for example, if you put on a different accent, then would that be something that would kind of change you I as well? I, I don't know. I think that dialect is really connected to community. I think language mm. is connected to community and belonging. I think language is connected to home. Mm. You know, so therefore, you know, the things, the the slang that we develop, the words that we come to love, the words that we come to know is familiar that nan or gran or dad or mum have said or our carers or our guardians have said, mm. you know, it actually becomes part of who we are and it's comforting it's a familiar it language, isn't it? yeah it offers comfort so there was certainly a part there was certainly a point in my life when i felt very uncomfortable around posh people <laughs> i wouldn't blame you and this is the truth and i remember and my sister went through a, a bit weird thing. aren't they yeah. well i think it's just we felt less we felt like we were make you feel less or did you kind yeah, of have that feeling they made, us, they made me feel less and my sister worked in the banking industry for years in canary wolf mm. and she was often ridiculed for having a cockney That's accent ridiculous yeah, and pe- they probably found it funny. Right. But to her, she took it as a real dent. And she's doing the same job as they are, and she's yeah. just as good, if yeah. not better. Lev, would you describe yourself as posh? Yeah, probably. I'm from Surrey. I mean, Jesus Christ. <laughs> but now, what I'm saying is now, hey. I, 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 now I wouldn't even think you. 
I, I wouldn't even categorise that. That's just your yeah. accent. No, but there was a point in my life sorry, as a teenager, crisps, yeah. I, had, I had never been exposed to posh people. Mm. Like, I'd only ever been around people like, oh, what, what, how are you? What? Have a <laughs> oh, think, have, a, have an apple, have and pears and all that stuff, you know. And I do want to ask about Cockney rhyming slang, but that's still a thing. <laughs> yeah. and, um, <laughs> I had to learn that at school. You had to learn Cockney at school? Yeah. As in, like, just, like, a one-off English lesson, or was it more... Uh, just, Sorry. like, you know, like, you're doing your, like, little English lessons they're teaching you about co- um, Cockney rhyming slang and all that. So. I swear we only yeah. hear apples and pears, yeah. and then, like, yeah. The, the oh, so that's pears. the most common one, isn't yeah. it? Is that like, how often do you talk about brown, the Brown bread, you're dead. Yeah. Fall on your bottle and glass ass. Right. You know, like, if Having you... a giraffe. Yeah, having a giraffe laugh, yeah. You sound you... tired, just to be like, oh, here we fucking go. No, 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 you know what? I, I love Cockney slang, and actually, I, I was immersed in it as a child. My dad loved it, he still uses it. My dad's got lots of slang for his own money as well, you know, and I think slang's a beautiful thing because we learn to, you know, and even as an early years teacher, you rhyme is important for reading, mm. you know, so when you hear Cockney slang being used in the home, it ain't a bad thing because it is really important for reading. And... um but no, Cockney slang's really simple. Basically, lots of people used to believe it was used by criminals only, like gangster type well, people in the coded East End. language. Cause... Coded language. And it's partly true, but it was actually the Costa Mongers, which is what... What's Costa Monger? Costa Monger are the market sellers. Oh. So that was the original name for a market seller, Costa Monger. And they used to use them because lots of poor people post blitz in the East End could not afford coal and could not afford decent food so they would never go into top end shops right so the costa mongers would go and by whatever means some of it was criminal criminal activity yeah, yeah, they would get hold of certain food and they would sell it at the markets the poor people seems so like a, a robin hood type, yeah. type scenario you know and um Not they so devised really yeah. cockney slang you know because um it was so the police so they could evade what them the police and the police police wouldn't understand what they were saying. <laughs> That's clever. Yeah, and so it really is. Considering the fact that you, you know, like we were just talking before about the fact that you know, like there was that sort of almost suppression of information in in sort of in the more lower class areas. Is lower class the right word? I don't know. No, it is. Yeah. yeah. So the poorer like, yeah, areas. And then, but then you yeah. come up with a clever way around the fact that these people are trying yeah. to dick on you. you yeah. Know? I think that's I quite. Think, God, like you know, don't get me wrong. Um, people in the East End, and I'm I'm not being biased here. I yeah, remember I growing up with there. I remember growing up with people that were incredibly entrepreneurial mm. and they just didn't have the resources and actually um my in my one of my early poems the one I mentioned earlier what's a free word worth there's a line where I say when you ain't got money you've got ideas mm. and that's truly it when you don't have money you know drive often stems from so the the survival instinct yeah the so need to yeah generate. so to be hyper driven is like right I've got to generate something to survive that's where it comes from and i met so many people that could have been like dragon den type people mm. could have gone on and you know created their own products and businesses and they, they they didn't because they weren't in that mental capacity as well it wasn't yes they didn't have the financial capacity but actually so the social economic status mm. and the education system and the government had, had worn them down to believe that they were less yeah. You know, and I've, it's after their a means, while, yeah. like, you know, because it's it's there's that whole sort of, of like, yeah. if you want to start a business, you'll need capital, and where you're yeah. going to find that pleb. Yeah, yeah, that basically, kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a line that I've just written in my poem, and it's about this idea that um, people thought I was going to be a pleasant pleb. <laughs> you know, like the pleasant I'm gonna, pleb, yeah. Like that. And I'm like, I mean, I don't like it. No, yeah, no, 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 no. It's, it's, but yeah, I love playing on words like that, and I'm. And it's like, oh, she, 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 she'll be a quiet one. And when I was a journalist, I, I felt that way. Yeah. Oh, she's like the token, the token, oh, look, we're supporting the working class oh, community. And, you know, yeah. she's a pleasant pleb, you know. But little did they know that I was a, I was a pleb with a passion. Yeah, a pleb with a bit of fire under you. Yeah. Plebita. I yeah, call myself plebita. the plebita. <laughs> <laughs> the plebinator. I am the plebinator. <laughs> look at him, like, and then I'm going to rob you cunts on principle. <laughs> <laughs> now, where's your fucking horse? <laughs> Give me your money. Get out of my pub. Yeah, just standing there. It's like, you don't carry a knife? Oh, just me then, cunts. Give us your wallet. <laughs> right? If they're going to look at you like it, you yeah. might as well play into it. It's true. No, so, yeah. so in answer to what you're saying Come about... Here, like, yeah, <laughs> the lack of education. in like, I see it now. Now my dad's older. Mm. I see my dad has got so many, so many skills and... You know, and he's really tried over the years. I've seen his growth and change, you know. Um, and when I think back, and I must say, despite the marriage, despite the kind of marriage my parents had and the early experience I had, you know, 
I, I, I do. There is something in the other way. I found something I do up think, as well. I, like, I do think people deserve a second chance, and I yeah. think my, you, you know, well, my actually. dad has really like um, worked hard to be the best father he can be with the tools that he's had. Yeah. And I think that sometimes we have to, even though when we get angry at our parents, and I was angry and rageful for years with different aspects of both my parents we have to meet it with you you have to meet the human side of them and understand that what 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 did culture give them at the time what did society give them at the time what tools were they gifted Mm. to understand their own internal dialogue their own early childhood like like sometimes how did he how did you kind of sorry i don't don't want to cut you off at all because i think that where you're going is really good but it's like because you've said that, you know, like, so you had the whole background in which your dad was quite sort of emotionally violent and violent, and then your mum left. How did he reconcile with you emotionally after? I mean, like, what was the turning point for you where you were like, all right, I'll give him a chance kind of thing? I think the turning point was my mum dying um, because my mum for years had been the root of our family. Me, mm. it was always me, Sarah and mum. My sister's three years older than me. My mum was just a Did power you live with your mum afterwards? Yeah, so okay. my mum, my parents separated. I was eight, my sister was 11. Mm. And my um, dad, my dad, we used to see my dad on a Sunday and he would, he almost affect, he almost became like fun time dad, really. He'd pick us up, we'd go ice skating and he taught us how to swim. He That's used to nice. take us, oh yeah, you he know. He still made the effort. Though. Oh, massively, you know, and he yeah. did what he could with the tools he had. But he was always a very quiet man and he was quiet That's because in a way, again, it's the linguistic skill, yeah. the vocabulary that wasn't there, yeah. And so it's, I sometimes think between the pair of them, my mum was like this massive sociable person, mm. compassionate, empathetic, lib- all those kind of opposites attract Yeah. Them chatty and my dad was like this man of very few words obsessed with football always had his head under a motor because he was a mechanic oh, you know and it was like they were so very different very archetypal yeah yeah mate. yeah and very and <laughs> but he's really i think it's a really important question that you ask because for a long time it was all about my mum because of course she was the root and when mum died i was like well you know we've just got to try and piece together a different you know it's almost like i often equate it to like say you've got a car and it loses a wheel that car can still run, mm. but it, um, especially if you turn it into a free wheeler, but it's going to run, go. yeah, but yeah, but it's going to run a bit differently, you know, and yeah. I think that wonky. a lot of, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a bit <laughs> wonky, and I think it's a good metaphor for people who, who for kids who experience parent separation, it, it's different, but it, won't, it will still run eventually, you know, and um, we, over time, we saw my dad, oddly, more when my parents separated, because my mum was just always doing everything. My dad was mm. always at work or at the pub at the time, and back in the day. Did you get to go? Did you go to see him at the pub, or was it like? Yeah, no, we never. My mum wasn't much of a drinker, so we never went to the pub. But my. Um, so how old were you when your parents separated again? Sorry. So it was the. the it was eighty seven. So eighty seven, eighty eight. I was just about to turn eight. Oh, okay. So oh, and it was so actually yeah. it was actually the the month of the Great Storm, and oh, I yeah. really want to write a poem called The Great Storm, and it's going to be about the night that my mum left my dad and the first line is and this isn't this isn't a lie I was playing with my Barbie and my Ken upstairs and the first line of it was going to be my Barbie and Ken weren't feeling very zen that night (laughs) you know boom 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 (laughs) but it's quite a good but yeah I just want to say he's done his best you know and I think that he's you know you come to understand I've come to understand I can't say others but Mm. through training to be a therapist and having and really delving deep into my own feelings. Sometimes it isn't about blame, it's understanding the circumstances at the time. And I think when my mum passed, I was able to look at my life through a different window, metaphorically. So with the, I, I, instead of looking at it down this tunnel, I, I took it from a different perspective and I, I tried to understand Very what difficult. was going on around them at the time mm. that would have put pressure on their situation. And, it's quite you know, my mum gave theory, as good it? as she got. My mum, you know, they, they argued yeah. massively, you know, and my mum gave back, you know, but, you know, equally, I think the best example she ever modelled to me and my sister was leaving, yeah. you know, and I've got myself into mm-hmm. one situation where it wasn't like that, but it was, he wasn't very nice to me verbally. And I under, there was a point where I stayed for a while and then almost like the penny dropped and I was like, oh, this has got to change and I so, left touch upon that point in your like adult life in terms of relationship did that impact impact the literally just wrote that question down (laughs) how did that (laughs) and you're doing short